by trustee Andy Dandy and Sparkwatch says it is 10 o'clock, so we'll start. This is the last of the series of power programs that I'm giving. So welcome to the wrap-up session. Well, maybe welcome to the wrap-up session. <laughs> Well, we may have a number of eyes here. Same. Thanks. There we go. So today we'll talk about hydrogen energy. And there's the global consumption of hydrogen for refining methanol, ammonia production, and transportation. Biomass energy from wood chips. This is the GRU plant where you have uh, wood pellets in the uh, foreground and the biomass conversion is in the background. Waste energy, we're gonna burn garbage. And this you've seen before, it's one of those plants. Doesn't matter what you put in the section over here on the left. Doesn't matter what the fuel is, you get steam and everything from the steam valve out is the same. Geothermal energy, we're going to look at heat from a hole. And that's old faithful. Nuclear fission, we're going to split up some uranium. And there's how you do it. You have a neutron with a U-235 nucleus. It gets all excited, blows apart, and gives off three more neutrons. And we're going to do nuclear fusion. We're going to combine some hydrogen. So you need deuterium and tritium um, in order to do the nuclear fusion the most efficiently. You could use two deuterium atoms, but you get a lot less yield out of that than if you use deuterium and tritium. So leftovers from last week, Forrest Crawford told me that in Pennsylvania, they are uh, taking the used fly ash and putting it in the old coal mine. And well, the laser works, but that's not particularly good. I can't advance the slides. So for those of you online, you have a good day. You don't have to look at me. Marguerite Ruth told us last week that she has a coal miner statue, and it's made out of coal. And here he is. He's got his helmet on his head with his light to work in the mine. Uh, but it reminds me a great deal of a statue I saw in Copenhagen. Okay, if stack plumes, uh, I think John asked, asked about it. Somebody asked about this. this is showing that with very light winds, the, um, the plumes that come up from a burning or a stack will be up high and they'll float off and they'll take whatever they have further away. If the wind is blowing hard, it's going to put it all down real low. Uh, when I first met Carol, they lived in upstate New York, and there was a nearby power plant, and it was always putting ash and grit and everything in the air. So her mother had to be careful when she wanted to hang the laundry outside because it would come back in dirtier than she put it there. Does this it is depend a, upon the, the temperature of the air as well? Uh, it depends on the temperature difference of the air, yes, because uh, the stack gases are quite hot pushing uh, hundreds of degrees, right. and they tend to rise because they're, they're far less dense. Mm -hmm. This is a typical, on the right you see uh, cooling towers, and that's just steam from the cooling tower. They spray water in the cooling tower. Uh, I was in the one down in Crystal River, and when you go in there, it's like a sauna, and they're spraying water, and it doesn't land on you because it, it's cooling off the rest of the uh, 
condenser and uh, the gas goes up, but the stack gas there, the big stack in the middle, is what you would typically see from a coal plant or a gas plant. It's mostly just steam and it evaporates quickly, but it also can contain uh, radioactive materials from a coal plant, uh, not so much from a, a gas plant, but, but that uh, disperses pretty quickly. All right, let's go to hydrogen. It was discovered, Henry Cavendish in the UK, early 1800, I didn't realize that. It, electrolysis was discovered, how you could uh, get hydrogen and oxygen from water. Uh, a fuel cell effect was discovered in 1838. That's amazing uh, because it's still not greatly in use today. We'll talk about them later. The Hindenburg crash, we know about the hydrogen there. A five kilowatt fuel cell was powered an electric welder in 1959. 1990 solar powered hydrogen production plant in Germany. 2003, the Bush program put a $1.2 billion uh, infusion of money in the hydrogen fuel initiative. 2023, Biden program, $9.5 billion for hydrogen hubs and hydrogen production. So we don't spend much time on this. This just shows you if water goes down through the ground and down really, really deep on the left, You'll see um, down here you have uranium and thorium in the rocks, and they have radioactive decay, and that can liberate hydrogen. In the middle down there, you have uh, water on olivine, which is iron-rich metal, and that can cause hydrogen to be released. And it goes up floating through the water and through the some mines over on the right. Uh, but it's pretty tricky. Okay, we have steam methane reforming um, that happens when you um, put steam, we talked about that last week, and coal gas. Uh, methane reacts with steam under low pressure. <clears throat> um, one bar is one atmospheric pressure. Um, you can use a catalyst and you can get hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and some carbon dioxide. So it's it's endothermic. You have to have um, uh, heat in order for the process to proceed. So, ah, there we go. So Perfect. Thank you. Whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. I can go back over. And if there's still anybody left on Zoom, oh. unfortunately, they'll be able to see you. You think they can't see you? No. <laughs> they, they made a mistake and they're accidentally on Zoom for this lecture. <laughs> so that's a, a methane, or excuse me, a hydrogen generating plant. Like I talked about yesterday here in Gainesville, we had uh, water, water gas or coal gas. And then there's electrolysis. You can get your hydrogen from electrolysis. Uh, this is what that looks like. You have uh, electricity coming from the power grid. You run it through rectifiers and you come down into the vat. The cathode will generate oxygen on the left. The anode will generate hydrogen on the right. And they have water purification in order to uh, keep other uh, minerals out of this. Now we had, this was on the submarine. Because if you're going to go and shut the hatch for two months, you're going to run out of your oxygen that you brought with you pretty quickly. So we had an electrolytic converter. We pumped the hydrogen overboard and breathed the oxygen and shared every disease anyone had. This is a newer type of uh, electrolytic uh, conversion and is supposed to be more uh, efficient but I think it's still under development as opposed to in operation. So this is a fuel cell I talked about. And here you have uh, hydrogen coming in on one side, oxygen coming in on the other side, 
And as a result, they're combining in the middle to make water and electricity comes out. So it's silent and it has nothing but water as its output. So hydrogen wells <laughs> in the South Australia, they had uh, prospectors found some hydrogen wells when they were prospecting for oil. And that may or may not be nearby. Uh, in Western Mali, uh, guys were digging a well for water. One of the guys was smoking and it flared up and burned his face. So he said, well, we have hydrogen. And so this is similar to what the wells they were digging. They were not very deep wells. And this is what it looks like from a hydrogen well. You have hydrogen in various places in the uh, throughout the, the depth of the well. So there's some hydrogen in water down below. There's free hydrogen in sandstone you might get out. And then there may be a karst zone with free hydrogen gas. So that's roughly what a hydrogen well looks like. Ooh, I did that again. Uh, and I did it again. Okay, wait a minute. Where's the back button? Oh, where's the camera? Okay, this was a bunch of test wells that they built in Mali. Uh, there was no indication from uh, the article that I was reading that they were ever developing the hydrogen as a product. So in Nebraska, there was a hydrogen well that was started and it hit a snag, but work continues uh, with some of those billions of dollars that uh, are in play from both Bush and uh, Biden. Okay, commercial production. Now this is a little busy and if I don't turn it off again, I can point at it. So on the left side is how do you produce hydrogen? Electrolysis. And you can use that hydrogen, sustainable CO2, and you can make synthetic fuels. Or with nitrogen, you can make green ammonia. And up in here, there's no transformation. It's just the hydrogen gas. How is it transported? You can, in shipping, trucks, pipelines, and storage tanks. And where is it used? Industry, steel industry uses it, chemical industry, refineries, and transport, shipping, you can use it for your fuel instead of uh, coal or oil or petroleum products um, and all kinds of vehicles. You can use it for heating and you can use it for power generation for the grid. I showed you this earlier, just a repeat of where hydrogen is used. Um, ammonia production, 55%, petroleum refining, 25%, methanol production, 10%. Uh, we used to have methanol on the submarine for the torpedoes. And some of the guys thought if you filter it through bread, it's okay to drink and it becomes magically ethanol. That doesn't work. 10% uh, in transportation or other. So in food, hydrogenate, hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils. And I remember uh, when I was a kid, see, look at the peanut butter on the right. And you can still get hydrogenated peanut butter and you don't have to mix it up. I buy the natural kind and I spend, uh, that's how part of my exercise program is to stir it up. <laughs> Metal working, uh, metal alloy, a lot of hydrogen or, or hydrides in uh, metals make it much stronger. In welding, I, you can see uh, the hydrogen burns at a very hot temperature between, uh, up, what, a few thousand degrees maybe, but if you mix it with the oxygen, you can have a, a, a really hot welding torch and you can uh, cut through the submarine hull with it. And flat glass production, I didn't, didn't know that hydrogen and nitrogen are used to prevent oxidation while they're making the glass. Electronics, all kinds of electronics devices. And medical, hydrogen peroxide, we probably have some, I have some under the sink. And it's an antiseptic. 
and uh, therapeutic gas for different diseases. Don't know anything about that. And transportation, fuel cells, engines, and space rockets. So how do you store it and transport it in pipelines, compressed gas and trucks, liquefied hydrogen storage and shipment? And the pros and cons, it burns cleanly, it produces water. And it's, you can twice the mileage uh, from a gasoline engine in a car if you have a hydrogen burning car. Uh, it's expensive to produce. A new infrastructure is needed. That's why there's billions of dollars in the uh, budget for infrastructure and hub. You can't take your hydrogen burning car and pull up to a gas station because it won't work. It's more subject to leakage. It's the smallest molecule that we know. And so it can sneak through barriers. So the storage of hydrogen has to be very carefully manufactured and controlled to minimize leakage. And it's highly flammable. Think Hindenburg. Okay, let's go to biomass. The biomass energy plant, this is what it looks like. And it's claimed to be uh, renewable, which it sort of is. It's claimed to be clean, which it isn't. Yeah. Um, so here's what the deal is. You you have trees, and the lim lumber industry is cutting them up. They have leftovers and wood residue. This stuff is giving off CO2. You have to transport it to a pellet factory where they grind it up so you can drop it into the uh, energy plant. That gives off CO2. You have waste transport taking it over to the uh, plant, dumping it. And then there you have a biomass power plant, and that produces CO2. Um, that's enough of it. The energy plant, we have the Gainesville Regional Utility Biomass Plant, which is very controversial. Um, Jack and I have a friend, Dick Dickinson, who is in forestry, sustainable forestry, and he was very against this plant because he said, it's not really sustainable. Uh, you burn up the wood, and then 50 years later, you might have a tree you can cut down to put more wood in. Uh, 2011, the construction, operational 2013, 2014, first power, and it has some kind of chain of custody certification from the Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, I don't know where you buy those. So the energy history, this is a, an interesting one. Uh, I'll show it now and talk about it now and again. The brown is the wood and wood derived fuels, and the top is waste energy to, or, you know, burning garbage to get waste. And you can see that it's kind of running along fairly constant over the last 20 years or so. So there haven't been a great deal of additional biomass or of wood and wood derived fuels. You can also, also burn up forest or uh, farming products. Uh, whatever it will burn, you can burn it in, bi in biomass and get energy. So the pros, it's renewable, question mark. It's reliable, I guess. It's abundant, yeah. And in Florida, when we have a hurricane, there's a lot of biomass available. And I'm not sure if GRU has a contractor that runs up to the panhandle and brings it back down. It's waste reduction because that stuff is going to sit around and be waste. And it's carbon neutral, sort of. The cons, it's expensive. You have to build a plant. You have to transport the stuff to the plant. And the harvesting and transportation. And then you have to have storage on site. So it requires space, land, there are gas emissions from the plants, CO2 and perhaps others. The greenhouse gases, nitrogen dioxide or oxides, oxides, carbon monoxide, and possibly some methane. It has an environmental impact. 
because of deforestation. If you're going to burn all that wood, you got to get it somewhere. It's a monoculture crop if you're going to plant your forest with uh, slash pine or some other fast growing trees. You're going to have a monoculture crop, which is not good for uh, inhabitants of the forest. And you may be overusing fertilizers to grow that monoculture crop closer together than it would normally do. And it's inefficient. Sometimes more energy to burn the stuff that is, is produced by the process. So what's the future is again one of the few options to replace fossil fuels. Their new technology is needed to make it more efficient. A big set of drawbacks make it difficult to be widely implemented. Transportation and not in my backyard. Okay, waste energy. Same thing, except we're going to burn garbage instead of wood pellets. Convert non-recyclable waste to energy. One way you can do it, you can burn the landfill gas uh, I used to drive by the landfill in Citrus County frequently on the way to Inverness, and you look out there and they have a flurry. They have some stacks going up from the uh, landfill and they're burning off the methane. But you can use it directly. Methane is produced uh, down in the pit here, which is it's got a lining so it doesn't. Uh, interfere with the uh, freshwater drinking supply, the lining breaks occasionally, and it's covered, and they have the gas collection wells inside the, uh, the landfill. You can grab that gas and clean it and uh, have a gasoline engine, and, or a gas engine rather, and electric generation, and, and put it on the grid. So that's landfill use. The other thing is you can burn the waste directly to generate power. And this is the same thing I showed you. Uh, here we have dump truck dumping the garbage into a pit and a big claw, uh, like the little boy was caught in the machine in Europe, I think it was. But they take the garbage, dump it on here, and it slides down into the furnace and it creates steam, which goes out to the generators and um, down here. And then the stack gases go through a purification and scrubber and uh, some other fabric filters to clean it up before it's put out into the atmosphere. Well, what's the fuel source for the burning? The fuel source is the garbage. I have never been able to find out how you light off a coal plant or an oil plant or a garbage plant or a, uh, a pellet wood plant initially. There was nothing there. I suspect they had natural gas coming in to get it started. Uh, garbage is hard to, to set on fire if you've ever had, a, had your own garbage pit and it stinks. Okay, this is the one in Pinellas County. It opened in 83, two boilers and one turbine. And third boiler and second turbine was added in 86. The storage capacity is three days worth of garbage in their pit. It burns an average of 2,700 tons of garbage per day. It burns around 2,000 to 2,200 degrees F, which is pretty much uh, high enough to break down all the chemicals that are in the garbage. Approximately 60 million pounds of metal are recovered every year from the uh, pit below the burning chamber. They have a, a sophisticated uh, air pollution control system to clean the gas, and the gas is monitored continually. This is propaganda from the website. It's monitored continually to make sure it doesn't exceed state and federal regulations. It has 75 milli, uh, megawatt capacity, 45,000 homes, but about 15 megawatts are used to run the plant itself. 60, uh, 60 megawatts are sold to Duke Energy. 
This is the uh, St. Pete or Pinellas County uh, garbage to energy plant. What are the pros? Again, it's it's renewable because we have plenty of garbage. It reduces the waste in landfills, and there's resource recovery. Metal is in the slag. It's reliable. You make heat, you make steam, you make power. The cons is a high cost again. The new plants of anything cost a lot of money. Uh, it has a required space to be uh, built on and, and an isolation from neighbors because they don't want it in their backyard because they think they'll smell it and maybe they will. It disincentivizes, disincentivizes recycling because, hey, if I, if I don't have to separate my stuff and they're going to burn it anyway, I'll just throw it all together. And there's some adverse environmental impacts, CO2 emission, not just gases, but they have, as with coal plants, they have technology to address those issues. And there may be some plastic in the residue for incomplete burning. What's the future of waste energy? The same as uh, uh, biomass can replace fossil fuels. New technology is needed to make it more efficient. Big set of drawbacks make it difficult to be widely implemented. So let's go to geothermal. We're going to jump down in the ground now. 10,000 years ago, North American indigenous uh, our natives were using hot springs because there's hot springs in various places around the country. The Hippocrates recommended hot baths in BC. I love a hot bath. Uh, Plenty the Elder recommends hot baths for muscle fatigue. That's why we have a hot tub up there near the exercise uh, pool. The Vikings, when they came to Iceland, they found hot pools everywhere, and we'll talk about that. Uh, hotels and spas in California, the geysers in Northwest California open. And it's up here. Hit the right button. That's here. The geysers are north of Santa Rosa, northwest of um, Sacramento. The first geothermal power plant was in Italy in 1904, and this may or may not be a picture of it. 1921, the first geothermal power plant in the USA at the geysers, 250 kilowatts. I have just shown you the geysers on the map. Hot Springs National Park in 1921. First commercial geothermal greenhouse in the uh, U.S. was in 1930 in Boise. And then there's been post-World War II development, and let's look at some of that. So what is it? It's heat within the earth, geo-earth thermal heat. Geothermal energy locations, look at that. Where would you expect them to be? They're around where the tectonic plates are sliding up against each other or pulling apart from each other. And so that's all around the Pacific Rim. And you can see all of the red in the Central Atlantic, North and South, and in uh, Southern Europe and Asia. And the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire. So geothermal worldwide use, uh, we'll just look quickly at this, but megawatts thermal, China is the biggest, um, United States next, then the rest fall off dramatically. And uh, terajoules per year, China is really big, the US is next, and the others fall off very rapidly. And the megawatts per population, Iceland is going to win that by a whole lot. They have a lot of geothermal energy and they don't have very many people. So they win that war and the rest of them is just based on population. So geothermal worldwide use. This is an interesting uh, chart. The uh, closest year of 2020 is on the left in all of these. And you can see the dramatic increase in uh, 
geothermal use and this number one, which is geothermal heat pumps. We'll talk about those. Bathing and swimming, dramatic increase. Space heating, dramatic increase. Greenhouse heating, a little bit here and there. Aquaculture, pond heating, not much. Industrial, not much. World's largest geothermal plant. Anybody want to guess where it is? Wrong. It's in California. 1.2 gigawatts of power at the uh, uh, Geyser Geothermal Complex. So they have uh, 15 power plants. Geothermal use in the USA, there's 31 plants, all but two are in California and Nevada. And that's to be expected. So heated rocks and steam vents, that's geothermal energy. This is in Iceland. Uh, it's probably a geothermal plant. But if you look, here's a, what looks like a bunch of pipelines. And we'll talk about where that may be going in a little while. Heat pumps for energy source. And this we mentioned briefly uh, in one of the other talks. But if you have a heat pump, which is what most of the air conditioning systems are in private homes now, you have the, the heat exchanger and the heat pump is here. In the winter, you want to pump heat up and drain take the cold air down and run it through water pipes that are underground. And as it goes down, it will be heated up to 70 or so degrees, makes the heat pump extremely efficient rather than trying to take outside air at 20 degrees and heat it up to 70 degrees. You can take 70 degree water from the ground and heat it up to 80 pretty efficiently. The same with cooling. You just reverse the pump and you pump hot air down and it's absorbed. And actually, which way is it run? Left or right? So the hot air gets absorbed and then the, the uh, rest of the heat is transferred. You get some 70 degree water coming back up. And once again, it's a lot easier to cool something down using 70 degree water than it is using uh, 90 or 100 degree air outside. Geothermal energy plant types. This is a dry steam power plant. So you have a pipe going underground and it's getting the steam directly from underground and dumping it into a turbine and pumping the uh, condensed water back down underground. This is a flash steam. You get uh, superheated water up into a, a big tank and you allow the, uh, the steam to come out of the superheated water, run the turbine and send the rest of it back down. Here we have a binary power. So we're using uh, the hot water and steam in a heat exchanger and we can use very purified water to run our turbine and not be uh, subject to getting uh, plating of any of the metals that might be in the steam onto the turbine blades. So it's a better use of the energy cleaner. So the history of Iceland, the Vikings were using the thermal springs for washing and bathing. And when we went on a cruise to Iceland, a number of the passengers went out to some of the thermal springs and uh, got themselves a nice hot bath. One or more of them contracted some kind of a disease while they were there. I didn't go. It's the tectonic boundaries. This is Iceland and you can see that this is the North American plate going to North America, the Eurasian plate going to Eurasia. And if you stand in the right place in Iceland, I didn't bring a picture of it, but there, there's a ravine that runs kind of through the middle of Iceland. 
And if you put your foot on one side of the ravine, you're in North America, and on the other side, you're in Eurasia. So they have a lot of thermal energy. Snow and ice removal is one of the things that they do with it. Uh, this is a street or sidewalk or both, and they're laying down pipes to pump hot water to melt the snow and ice on the streets and the sidewalks in Reykjavik. They, of course, do electronic generation. And this is another view of a different geothermal plant. They run it into their greenhouses. They do their building heating. They pump hot water, particularly in the capital of Reykjavik. They pump hot water to all the houses to use for heating and as well as uh, showers and bathing. So free heat for those people, lucky. I don't think I want to be there for the rest of the season. Then. Uh, home hot water. Okay, here's your transportation. I feel like I talk about that in all of our energy talks. Um, it's impossible unless you uh, pump hot water around. You can't store it anywhere because it's coming from the ground where the hot mantle is getting close to the surface. But you can send the hot water around for use at a distance, but it's inefficient to try to send steam around. It's better to put the plant where the steam is than to try to pipe the steam any distance. And they can run their electric grid. So the pros, reliable source of power, small land footprint, and it's usable for large and small scale installations, depending on how much geothermal heat you can get at that location. And the energy industry is expanding, but only where you have the geothermal around the, around the ring of fire and where there's uh, steam coming up. It has long longevity because uh, it's been there for millions of years, and it's probably going to still be there for a few million more years. But there are a few things that are wrong with it. It's location dependent. If you don't live in Iceland or in anywhere around these tectonic plate um, crashing into or departing from each other, uh, you're not going to be able to get it. High initial costs. And in some cases, it could lead to surface instability. If you're pulling the steam out or the hot water out and not re-injecting it underground, then there may be a problem uh, later with the subsidence in the general area. So what's the future use? It's expanding location dependent. All right, let's get into the good stuff here. Vision. Cleaving or splitting into parts, spontaneous fission, no external influence, and then induced fission, a thermal neutron is hitting a uranium-235 atom, and it separates with a 200 MeV, a million electron volts, a measure of energy on the nuclear scale. So this again, you saw a neutron comes in and it's a thermal neutron coming in to split the atom. These are fast neutrons or high energy neutrons that are given off by the fission product, and they have to be slowed down to the thermal energy to again be easily absorbed by U-235 to create fission. Okay, what are isotopes? We gone through that before and everybody knows they're the same chemical but they have a higher nuclear mass so uh, hydrogen or deuterium on the second slide and uh, tritium has two extra neutrons the hydrogen is stable deuterium is stable tritium is not and if there was ever a nuclear weapon accident or incident on a submarine or other nuclear equipped ship from the weapon. It would be a lot of fun because the, the uh, solution to 
Getting rid of the tritium in your body is to drink beer. <laughs> okay, uranium is naturally unstable. So here are the two principal isotopes. U-235 is only seven-tenths of a percent by uh, weight or volume, and U-238 is generally the rest of it. There's U-233 and 4 and 9, but they are not of interest to us. They're not stable enough for us to use. So the half-life half life means that at the end of the half-life, in this case, uh, for U-235, 700 million years, you have half of your U-235 left. So uh, we know that U-235, if they were all uh, generated by the stellar explosions, if they were equal in amount, uh, we've had a lot of loss of U-235 over the four and a half billion years that uh, the Earth is thought to be of age. The appearance is silver gray. Where is it found? This is the world view of uh, uranium production around the world, and the big squares have more production, the little squares have less. Uh, in the paper today, I think there was an article that uh, in near the Grand Canyon, they're proposing a uranium mine, and I don't know how far that will get. Not far. Yeah. Not far one hopes. Uh, so this is, just tells you around the world where you can find a uranium mine. Czech Republic, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and so forth. So here's the fission process. You have a thermal neutron coming in to U-235, and you have to concentrate the U-235, typically done with centrifuges like they're doing in Iran or like we did in the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority during the war. And we're old enough that when we say the war, we mean WW2. So it becomes an unstable U-236. So it's still 92 is the number of protons. Number of neutrons is 100 and whatever the difference is. You add one more and it becomes unstable and it, it sort of oscillates for not very long and then it blows apart. So here you're showing uh, krypton and uh, barium, is that right? Barium uh, being produced and three neutrons. So this is a chain reaction you have in the uh, the left, you have one atom, you split it, three neutrons, you split three more atoms, they each produce three more neutrons, and it keeps going uh, unless you have a way to stop it. That's called the bomb. We want to have power energy. So the fission products, it's very interesting. The, the way the atom splits, it never, almost never splits evenly. Usually it's uh, some on the left and some on the right of the midpoint. Uh, just the way it works, I guess. But uh, it's very difficult to split it into two equal radioactive products. So here's slow neutrons. That's what we need because the fission, they have a kinetic energy of like uh, 0.025 electron volts. And it's equivalent to approximately 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Fast neutrons are the ones produced by the fission. They have a kinetic energy of a billion electron volts, which is like 100 million times the energy of the thermal neutrons. And the, the nature of U-235 is it has a preference for thermal neutrons. So the, the fast neutrons typically don't have any interaction with the U-235. So how are we going to get these thermal neutrons out of the fast neutrons? You have to bounce them off of things. And so this is the bounce graph. It, they're coming out at about uh, one uh, megavolt, mega electron volt up here. 
And if you bounce them off of heavy stuff, it's just like bouncing a tennis ball off of a bowling ball. The tennis ball didn't lose very much energy at all. So uranium does not slow down the neutrons appreciably. Graphite is better, and that's what uh, Fermi used in the first reactor underneath the football stadium in Chicago. But if you use water, which is hydrogen, and I don't know why it's in French, hydrogen, uh, but after about nine bounces, it's down in the region where we want it to be. So it's much more efficient. Uh, Hydrogen by itself and regular water will absorb neutrons to a small amount. So if you use heavy water, which is deuterium oxide, you will not have that uh, absorption at all, and you can use uh, natural uranium in a deuterium plane. So electron volts to joules, it's hard to figure out what that means. So one electron volt is about 10 to the minus 19 joules, which is really not very much. One joule per second is one watt. One fission is about 200 million electron volts, so it's like 10 to the minus 11 joules. And one watt means that you need two times 10 to the minus, to the plus 29 fissions per second to get one watt of power. So when we say that uh, fission has a lot of power, you need a lot of uranium fissioning to get that. Okay, we, how do we do this? We create a controllable U-235 uh, critical mass. And like I said earlier, you have to <clears throat> concentrate the U-235 by uh, centrifuges. Uh, U-235 weighs a tiny fraction less than U-238. And so if you take uh, uranium hexafluoride gas, I think it is, and if you spin it through a centrifuge, the U-238 will be out in the far distant part, and the U-235 will be real close but next to it. But you can separate them out, but you need a whole lot of stages. I think Iran had like 500 or 1,000 centrifuges to, to separate it out. It's not easy to do. You can't do it chemically because they're the same chemical. So what we want is a critical mass, and it has to be big enough that the neutrons will be still within the critical mass to carry on the um, fissioning of the U-235. And so if you make your critical mass just right, it'll be a bomb. So we don't want that. So we need to confine it somehow so that the radiation products that are created by the fission don't get out into the atmosphere or into the uh, um, rest of the system. So you want to put it in a sandwich. And I was thinking of like a peanut butter sandwich, uh, going back to one of the earlier slides on peanut butter. But anyway, you need to contain it. So here's how it's done with cylindrical fuel rods. The yellow is a welded zircaloy alloy. So it's gas tight. And then the red is the fuel. And there's some springs and other things. So it allows for expansion. But you want to keep all of the products inside. And so you have a spacer. And you have to have something to allow the uh, neutrons to be slowed down and not get out. So you have a, a big uh, collection of nuclear fuel rods, but you have to intersperse in between them some control rods so you can control the reaction and not be a bomb. So the yellow are control rods graphically, and then the red are fuel rods, and if you move the control rods up, the reactions can start, and the yellow is indicating more heat. You have to cool the sandwich to absorb the heat. And this is uh, what a stack of tubular uh, fuel rods looks like with some control rods interspersed. 
And so you, you put them together and you have a whole bunch of these uh, modules in the reactor to reduce the power. And you have to cool it, so we combine everything in a pressure vessel. And that's showing you a steel, and the steel thickness of a pressure vessel is six inches, Will? Six, eight inches, 10 inches? They're very thick and very expensive, and it's a stainless steel. Pump cooling water to make steam Enclose everything in concrete for safety. So here we have the um, here's this concrete dome. These domes can be feet thick, and there's a pump pumps cooling water through the reactor into the steam generator, and then there's another pump to pump water into the steam generator, take the steam out to a turbine, make power, just like with everything else we've been talking about. So these are the reactors uh, historically. So on the left, we have the early prototype. Shipping port was a rickover project to show that you can uh, create electricity from nuclear power. Dresden and Fermi 1. Fermi 1 is, uh, was near Chicago. So this generation two, we're talking about light water uh, reactors. So light water, pressurized water, non-boiling. I'll show you that in a minute. The, these are boiling water reactors. Can do means Canadian deuterium reactors. And then the RBMK and BBER, I don't know exactly what they are there in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and RBMK may be the one that was at Chernobyl, I'm not sure. Uh, we did that a couple of years ago in the summer, Will and I talked about reactors and problems. Okay, generation three, they're advanced lightweight, light water reactor. So these are just some acronyms. EPR is the extreme pressure reactor. So you have um, super, condensed a uh, super compressed water so it's not boiling and making steam but if you let the pressure off it would flash the steam okay the near-term deployments are generation three plus they're evolutionary designs offering improved economics and improved safety uh, when we go back over here to BWR, the boiling water reactors are the ones that were in Fukushima by GE Hitachi. Uh, they're doing various improvements of the design for safety and economics. And on the far right, we have these generation four. They're still in planning. They're highly economical according to the manufacturers where economical means less than five or ten billion dollars to make one enhanced safety and i'll show you a slide of that but they put a lot of uh, automatic safety uh, equipment and designs into these reactors so you won't have the meltdown uh, like we had at three mile island and at fukushima and they're proliferation resistant to some extent because they're using after initial startup, some of them can just burn uh, natural uranium because they turn themselves into a, a breeder reactor. And we'll talk about that in a minute. What do we got? Natural light water and pressurized water. So this is a pressurized water reactor. You have the blue is the steam and the water. The uh, red on the left is the coolant water flowing through the steam generator to make steam and you go out and you get power to the grid. Boiling water is the same thing with no steam generator. You just boil the water in the reactor and pump it out as steam into the turbines and back again. So that's the major difference. Heavy water reactors are the same as light water reactors because they are water. And so you can have boiling water but I don't think they do. Uh, heavy water reactors are using uh, 
deuterium oxide, D2O. Breeder reactors are high energy reactors and you're making fuel and what it looks like, and we don't need all the details here, but if you look in the reactor itself, the red part are the fuel rods and the green parts around the periphery are the, uh, the fuel for the breeder reactor to convert into a U-238 uh, can be converted to U-239, which decays into plutonium which can be extracted and used as fuel also. And this, the difference here is just one case, you take the steam, uh, you take the heat right out into an external heat, external heat exchanger, or this one has an internal heat exchanger. So liquid metal cooled reactors, they're also the breeder reactors, but the uh, Nautilus second submarine was a liquid metal reactor. Uh, sodium, not good with seawater. After a few years of trying to get it running, they ripped it out and put in a pressurized water reactor. So this is a, the same uh, kind of an idea. You've got the heat, you have a heat exchanger, comes out here with an external heat exchanger to make the steam to run the turbine. Gas-cooled reactors are the same. Again, where you get your heat doesn't matter. You just need heat to make steam. So you have, it's a lower pressure because you're not boiling water and you're running the, uh, this case, CO2 coolant through the reactor, through the heat exchangers to make the steam to run the uh, turbine to make electricity. Molten salt reactors, um, this is a conceptual view of it. You have salt that's molten, so you have a lot of high temperature there, and it goes into the cooling salt out to the heat exchanger, which is also running with uh, liquid metal, and it comes to the heat exchanger here, and this is now running a gas turbine. So it's just like an airplane engine. We talked about those earlier. You have compressor down here. You recover some of the heat and you run it back through again. Advanced reactors. This is one of the safety things. If you look here, this is the reactor pressure vessel. And it's similar to the ones that the boiling water reactors are three mile islands big heavy pressure vessel three mile island the core melted down and was in a puddle in the bottom and uh, fukushima the core melted down was in a puddle at the bottom and melted its way out of the containment into the concrete enclosure the idea here is you have a melt plug in the bottom if you have the core melting and coming out you let it flow into a large spreading compartment so it's no longer a critical mass and you can hope with uh, various cooling to cool it all down and contain the disaster inside the building. Generation three reactors. This is a, a bad diagram, but I'm just gonna show you generation three and four some of the reactors had their fuel reprocessing on site. So the reactor is up here, it's got a sodium coolant and it's a breeder reactor. And at a certain point, you take the spent fuel rods out, put them up the on-site reprocessing plant, chop them up, put them in refinement and put them back into rods and put the rods back into the core. Generation four. Oh. They're, they're advanced and they're, they're conceptual. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Nuclear power plants around the world. This is in the US. The green are active plants. You see the two uh, down in Southeast Florida belong to Florida Power and Light. 
This is the one in Crystal River that shut down. So cancel plants are purplish and you can't tell the difference between closed plants. Um, so closed plants are shut down and they're being decontaminated. The cancel plant was shut down because they screwed up and do care. They destroyed the concrete enclosure. Uh, this is where nuclear power plants are around the world, the little black spots, and it also shows earthquake zones. So you can see that there are a number of reactors located in earthquake zones. And if you look up in this area around LA, there were a couple of plants that were shut down because of earthquake and on the coast. And everyone thought they might slide down into the Pacific Ocean. So they shut them down, they're decontaminating them. Okay, generation three reactors, standardized design to reduce the cost and the design recovery or design approval process. Simplified and more rugged design, higher availability and longer operating times, typically 60 years without having to refuel. Well, some of the aircraft carriers are going about that long now. And a 60-year-old aircraft carrier is probably the pilots would rather be on the new one. Uh, further reduced possibility of core belt accidents. I showed you a uh, substantial grace period so that if you're having a problem, you have time to recover from it without having to go in right away. A stronger reinforcement against aircraft impact. And that's interesting because the nuclear power plant in Crystal River, the concrete and structure was designed to be um, to withstand the 707 direct impact of the entire airplane and keep the reactor safe. It was never tested. Uh, <laughs> higher burn up use fuel more fully and reduce the amount of waste. Greater use of burnable absorbers or poisons. You can put some poison in the reactor. And if you burn it up, it is no longer a poison. It's already absorbed the neutrons. So you can have, uh, you can extend the life of the fuel because you have a way to get more neutrons to additional fuel. Okay, generation four, still in the planning stages, three thermal reactor design, supercritical water, very high temperature, molten salt, Three fast reactor designs, gas cooled, sodium cooled, liquid lab cooled. Love it. Okay, small modular reactors are where they're going now. Uh, a strong interest, it's a small, several hundred megawatt reactor. So you can put them on a smaller uh, geographical land requirement. Uh, you can also put them where the uh, grid is not easily accessible and provide power to those locations. Modular design, simpler site. Okay, here, here is the Bill Gates reactor. Terra Power and GE Hitachi. It's a natrium reactor, which is a takeoff on the Latin name for sodium. Uh, 345 megawatts electric, liquid sodium, with integrated molten salt storage. So it has a peak capacity to run off of the stored energy at 500 megawatts for five and a half hours before it has to go back to just running off of its reactor. They're putting it in a, a retiring coal plant site in Wyoming, traveling wave reactor, aspirational. After an initial load, it uses unenriched uranium and processed spent fuel. And it, centuries of non-proliferation clean power because they're not using enriched uranium. Molten chloride, fast reactors, very high temperatures for process heat. There are some industrial requirements where you need some process heat to, uh, to manufacture what you're working on. And thermal storage. So the pros and cons low carbon footprint, high operating availability around 90%, initial fuel costs spread over 10 to 40 or 60 years. Um, at high initial cost, I had uh, perhaps a billion, this, 
much more than that now. I think uh, Bill Gates is looking at about four billion. Uh, time to approval to build is more than five years. You're paying interest on all that loan you took out to build the plant, and uh, you have no return on investment until you are producing power, and nobody wants one nearby. Nuclear waste, on-site storage and disposal, decommissioning can cost about half the cost or a quarter of the cost of building it, because you've got to do something with all the waste, and you have a high insurance cost. So 25% uh, of existing reactors are planned to be shut down by 2026. 60 reactors are under construction or planned in 17 countries in the next six years. 110 power reactors of 110 gigawatt electric are planned and 300 more reactors are proposed in fast growing economies, uh, Southeast Asia where they have difficulty with power. Okay, where are we doing? Uh, we're running over again. Uh, nuclear waste and cleanup is a big problem with nuclear reactors. There is a high level waste that's more than two kilowatts per cubic meter of heat generated by the nuclear waste. That was a problem in one of the uh, Soviet sites that we talked about a couple of years ago. They stored this stuff and they did not provide adequate cooling so the steel and concrete barriers melted down and there was a huge dis, uh, disbursement of radioactive elements over a large section of, of Russia, which is now closed off. So 85,000 metric tons of high level waste, 2,000 tons more per year currently, intermediate level waste less than 2 kW per cubic meter, low level waste is less than 4 gigabecquerels, that means a becquerel is one um, radioactive uh, element uh, undergoing its radioactive series. So it's one, uh, four billion of the uh, radioactive elements that are going through uh, disintegration for alpha particles, 12 gigabecquerels or per ton for beta particles, which are electrons. Very low level. Uh, you can generally uh, get them at the background level of radioactive medical waste. Uh, the gloves that I used at Cornell were low level waste. And we had a problem because the Chinese explosions in the atmosphere were providing more radiation outside the building than inside the building. Incineration, you can, of the low level waste, you can incinerate or evaporate the liquids. Uh, vitrification means turning it into glass. Some waste converted to nuclear fuel, the actinides are radioactive uh, particles that end up in the chain of radiation from the uh, uranium, and they can be burned also. A metric ton is about 35 cubic feet. 85,000 tons is about 400,000 cubic meters, 3 million cubic feet, a 2,000 square foot, like a, a lot of the apartments here, 2,000 square feet, the large ones, stacked 40 feet high that could contain all of that stuff. All right, fusion is going to be quick because it isn't going to be on any time scale that any of us will be alive to see. Here's the tritium and the deuterium. It, Got a result of fusion, energy, helium, and a neutron. And the neutron is not as radioactive um, as other radioactive particles, but it will induce radioactivity and some other uh, chemicals. So it is a problem to be dealt with. So we're, it's a simple idea, commercial complex engineering problem. And it has reactions that tends to hundreds of thousands of degrees, and it doesn't matter whether you use Kelvin or Fahrenheit, it's really hot. So it's a reaction also at extreme low vacuum. So you need to have a big vacuum chamber. And there's no known materials to withstand these requirements under static conditions. So the solutions are magnetic confinement and an electromagnetic field or laser implosion, and I'll talk about it briefly. So here's the electromagnetic confinement. 
you have the hot gas running around this toroid and you hope it's all contained by the two magnetic fields that are created to run it around in a circle and you keep adding uh, deuterium and uh, tritium and this is the other kind this is laser fusion it shows you only like four laser beams going in and compressing a fuel module uh, little capsule but they're actually hundreds of laser beams and they have to be exactly coordinated to cause an implosion and with a little bit of luck you'll get some uh, fusion and some energy. Uh, this is just a bigger view of the tokamak, the so-called uh, toroidal field. This is a view of one of them cut apart and they can be quite sizable. Uh, so this is one, and we have, uh, I think there's some people here, but that, that's a really big thing. You can see scaffolding all around. Uh, this is not important except to notice how the initially in 2006, they thought for 5 billion euro uh, for 10 years. And then we come down to 2014 and they think, oh, we need 13 billion for another nine years. And you come down to 2018, you need 20 billion. Uh, and the size of the thing indicates the number of uh, euros or dollars, and it just keeps going. Future fusion power is way over the horizon, but it has a, a a great advantage, you get uh, clean energy if you can do it. Uh, the fundamental challenge is to get more energy out than you put in to make it happen. And there have been articles in the paper recently that say they have a positive output, but it only lasts for like micro microseconds. So it's centered on the tokamak because and stellarators, which are similar in climate. Um, and the laser ignition. The source of deuterium and tritium is an interesting problem. Most of the tritium is created in the can do reactors, the uh, Canadian deuterium reactors. And if they shut all of those down, where will you get your tritium to fire up these dudes if they ever work? So that's the end of it. I'm sorry that we run over several times. Uh, this is it. Uh, Julianne wants to show us a picture, I think. Oh, I do. <laughs> well, there's an article in today's paper. I mentioned it earlier. It was in the online sun. And uh, this is a picture of a recently uh, Miss America standing next to a nuclear fuel pod. She is a graduate. Uh, nuclear engineer and will be taking a job with uh, whatever the, the plant is. Anyway, so I thought that was very interesting, but it talks about Florida Power and their nuclear plants and where they are and where they're going. And the, the thrust of the article is we really need to get going more on nuclear energy because all the times I showed you that the wind doesn't blow sometimes, the sun doesn't shine sometimes, the, the water power doesn't work sometimes, uh, and the, the dam behind uh, uh, Lake Powell is running low in water, so they're running low in energy. So you need some sustainable energy power to cover the loss of when the others are shut down. So thank you. Sorry for the overtime. Walter, it says she she took a job as a core design engineer at Constellation Energy in Pennsylvania. Good for her. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Are you asking me? I don't have a question. I just want to talk about my uh, ranch and farm. House in Wyoming. Can you have a picture in the news? There was a picture in the news. Papers. With Putin and President Clinton standing together 
And they were sending the uranium that was harvested at this ranch to Russia. But there's a byproduct, I forget the name of it, it's yellow. And that went to Canada. So, <laughs> well, it may be the yellow cake uranium. Uh, but why did they send it to Russia to cover uranium? Uh, once in a while, we were friends with Russia. Uh, yellow cake is a source of uranium and it's uh, mined around the world and is processed into the uranium metal, which is then reprocessed to have higher U-235. Any other questions? I have one here. Okay. John, John Reiskin, go ahead. Hello, John. Can't hear you. John, let's see. I have my speakers up. Don't hear you, John. Um, hi, John. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Chat. Look at the chat. Good Any other questions here while we wait on John? Okay. Uh, we hear about small nuclear power units for neighborhoods. Uh, they will not be in neighborhoods because uh, you need a separation zone so they can be located not far from a neighborhood or particularly if you're in the middle of nowhere out west and you need to provide ranchers with power, uh, you can do that. Okay. I've checked on my settings. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you could just repeat it after you hear it, yeah. Walter. Uh, the um, I mean, I'm going way back to the, the earlier presentation. You you mentioned a sort of a passing that there's a hydrogen engine. Now, now is that an engine that burns uh, liquid hydrogen? Is that it? Well, can you the, kind of repeat? The, yeah. The question is uh, hydrogen engine and does it burn liquid hydrogen? You can run hydrogen through a regular gas engine, I believe, with some modification, because uh, we can run gasoline engines on natural gas with some modification. So it would be a low uh, pressure hydrogen. Uh, the question is, where do you put it in your tank? And where do you get it to put it in your tank? So that there are problems there, but there's lots of billions of dollars to try to solve the distribution of hydrogen and to provide hubs where people can uh, load up their car with hydrogen. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I guess my question was, what, what, what is the nature of the hydrogen? Is it a liquid or? No, I think it is not a liquid because you'd have to have it at very high pressure to maintain it liquid if uh, you didn't have it refrigerated to whatever the boiling point of hydrogen is, is minus a few hundred degrees. So, so it's a compressed it's a, gas? It's a compressed gas, uh, kind of like your natural gas engines in cars back when that was popular. Like propane. Yeah, like a propane. So, yeah. we, did you, did your army have a propane generator or was it diesel? The uh, army had a small reactor called the SL-1, which was on a trailer truck, but but and it was designed to uh, pull up near a lake, uh, yeah. provide the electrical power to electrolysis and generate nitrogen and hydrogen. The nitrogen yeah. was to be uh, wasted, really. The, or excuse me, the hydrogen was to be wasted. The nitrogen they were going to uh, use to uh, run vehicles. Yeah. Um, so the the. You answered a different question, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, some RVs have propane uh, generators in the in the recreation vehicles. 
Uh, some have gasoline, some have diesel, depends on the RV, but uh, natural gas or liquid propane can be used for a lot of things similar to what uh, gasoline can be used for, and hydrogen would probably work similarly. Yeah, they, would, they would use the hydrogen to combine with nitrogen in the air and get ammonia. Right. Uh, and then ammonia would be burned in the engine. We actually had pickup trucks running around Fort Belvoir with ammonia. <laughs> but the ammonia ate the engines up. So I would think so. It yeah. wasn't practical. Yeah. Sir? I thought I read about hydrogen fuel cells, which the output is electricity. Correct. So I, I mentioned it in passing and showed a little one, but it, it is a device that will um, take the hydrogen and take the oxygen and it combines and you get electricity out and you get water as the only product. So uh, fuel cells, you could put a fuel cell in a car and have an electric engine or electric motor to drive the car. Bus or a truck. Or a bus or a truck. So in the future. Now, so following up on that, uh, what is it? Can you give me some idea what the fuel cell looks like? What is its size and so on? I am not sure the size of a fuel cell. Um, but if it would fit in a car, it's not really very big and it has probably has a very good uh, power density in order to produce enough electricity to drive a car. A friend of mine was working at Westinghouse Research, and their project was to, because they were being paid by the coal industry, was to try to provide a fuel cell that would run on coal. Um, I don't think they ever got there. That was Westinghouse Research in uh, Pittsburgh. Okay. Oh, my God. Yeah. Thank you, welcome. <laughs> What's the history for gold gas?